Hello, and welcome back to What's New With Me. Today, uh, we're in episode six. So we've, we've been doing this for quite some time now. I put these out um, twice a month. And of course, on Wednesdays, if you watch them on YouTube. If not, you're listening to this on probably Spotify or Apple Podcasts or something like that. But I'm glad to have you here. Um, we're going to be talking about carbonation today. And uh, of course, um, some other things. But first things first, in part one, I always like to tell you what I'm drinking because I try to find something that um, normally for these I pull out a better bottle of what I have. And today I definitely have pulled out a better bottle of something I have, or hopefully better. This is my pear mead that I made from August 14th of 2017. So this thing is quite old. And I'm really excited to try it. It is very, very clear. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can kind of see. It's a dark kind of amber color. Looks really nice. Um, it is corked. So um, not necessarily, this is not in line with the carbonation talk today. But I was looking for something to drink. And this thing piqued my interest. So I'll open this up here. And uh, we'll pour some and start talking about it. But um, I've I definitely noticed for myself that if I, you almost have to put, the bottles you really want to keep out of sight and out of mind um, because it's really easy to just grab them and go crazy. And I only have one more bottle of this mead in existence. So if I want to, um, you know, cherish it, I guess two. I've got a big box that's like a 2020 box of wine bottles. Um, so I'll, I'll open that eventually. But I've only got one more 375 milliliter bottle of this pear mead. So I have to savor this as much as I can. But just smelling it, oh my gosh, that's got a great honey character. It's like a Desert Creek honey that I used at the time. I was really into that um, when I made this. Man, I'm going to pour some. Yeah. This thing looks awesome. Super, super clear. It's got a nice amber color. Like I said, it's, very, it's still no carbonation. But um, let's try it. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's definitely got some age on it. The pear is not as pronounced as I would like. I wish it was closer, had a stronger pear taste, but uh, ultimately it's there. It's the honey character that really pops for me. And I think that's important with mead making. If you're making a mead, even if it's the most radical tasting flavor you have ever made, you still need to make something that has a solid honey character because that's what mead is, is honey-based, honey character um, wine, essentially. But I'll be sipping on this tonight, and uh, I'm excited to to uh, keep trying this. So anyways, now let's go ahead and talk about the main subject today. In part two, we are going to be talking about um, carbonation. Now, this is a topic that it is very based in some science, because quite frankly, um, there's a lot of science behind this this topic. When you are making a mead, you are dealing with science, because yeast are living creatures, they feed, and they can be stressed out, and they can put off off flavors, and you have to know how much of what to put into your meads. So um, let's first start, before we even get into the topic of carbonation, because that's kind of the end of this little cycle. When you make a mead, you need to know a few important things, and I think if you're listening to this, you probably are a mead maker, so this is no new news to you. Maybe it is to somebody, um, and that's okay. When you're making a mead, you need to have a plan for what you want your mead to end up like, because if you do not plan on um, carbonating a mead, and then you get to the end of your mead making, like there's just some things to keep you from being able to carbonate. So let's say that you did want to make a carbonated mead. You're going to need to make sure that you know um, the volume, not the volume, the ABV of your yeast you're using, the possible ABV or their max ABV. So I'm going to start with, a let's say, a simple recipe, one uh, a traditional mead, one gallon of water, um, a three pound, like three pounds of any honey you choose, and I'm gonna use Lavin D47 just because it's easy. A lot, it's a very common one. If you use that recipe right there, that three pounds of honey is probably gonna get you to about 1.0, like eight, 1.090 gravity, which sits you at roughly 12%, I would say, um, and that's that's a good territory for being able to carbonate a mead 
um, and it'd be dry. So like if you use that D47, your yeast are going to eat all of the sugars in that mead because they can reach up to 14% or they can reach up to 1.105-ish, about ABV, I think is what that is, or gravity, excuse me. They can eat that much sugar. If you only have 1.07, 1 1.0, sorry, 1.080 or 1.090 gravity, yeast will just eat all the way through it which is fine, that's good. If you like a drier mead, you wanna make sure and have a yeast that eat through all of your sugars. And so you can always find every single bit of yeast information on the internet. If you're like, hey, I don't know um, the Red Star Rogue Premier yeast. I don't know what gravity, or sorry, what um, ABV tolerance it, ha it holds. Well, go look it up, Google it, and you can find it pretty easily. It's on almost all brewing sites and things. So uh, that's that's easy to find. but. You need to know that information first because then you can start to plan how to best get your mead to be carbonated. And um, there, there are ways, let me back up just a little bit. This is in regards to bottle carbonation. If you were trying to carbonate this by adding more sugar to be able to do so. There are ways to carbonate your mead by kegging and that is that requires zero additive sugar, zero extra anything. It's just putting it to a keg. But I'll get that, to that at the end. Um, that's just a simple process. It's kind of silly to talk about. So back to what I was saying, though. You've picked your mead. You have gotten all your, re your ingredients, your recipe. You put your mead together. The carbonation side, by the way, will not happen until closer to bottling time. So I would not worry about it until the mead has finished fermenting, at which point you can go ahead and then start thinking about the carbonation. So we made our mead, a gallon of water, three pounds of honey, lava and D47 packet. Let that go. The yeast have eaten through all the sugars. Let's pretend that the beginning gravity was 1.090. That sits you at about 12%. And then um, you're going to have zero sugar left, you probably fermented out to 1.000, which means that there is no more sugar content in there. Your yeast at this point, by the way, are not dead. They are still alive. And what's important to know is that is how the carbonation will occur. Yeast still alive plus sugar after fermentation, if they have not hit their cap, equals um, carbonation. So once your yeast have have stopped eating, they just kind of go to sleep, they hibernate. And that's where you see it at the bottom of a lot of your carboys, whatever you're using, um, the like yeast will settle at the bottom. That's them just chilling. They're just like waiting for the next meal to come by. Um, unless of course they've hit their cap, in which case they will probably start to die out. And that's normal. But if they haven't hit their cap, they're still alive. In our case, our mead we're making here, they are, uh, the yeast have not hit their cap, so they just kind of go to the bottom. If you let your mead sit for maybe a month or two, you'll see that all the sediment, all the yeast, all the particles that are floating around will generally start to settle to the bottom, which you start to get a clearer mead. At this point, you need to be racking your mead over into a new container. And you might be thinking, okay, if I want to carbonate my mead, I need to make sure and get a bunch of yeast into this next container. Not totally true. There are still yeast kind of interspersed and mixed inside of your mead, even if it looks clear, they will start to pick up. Do you want a little bit of uh, yeast in there to help, the, help it carbonate in the future? Yes, but you do not need to just like dump your whole tub into a different thing because you're not really racking off like the sediment side of things. So let's say that your, your mead finished, you've racked it over into a new container, there's still a little bit of sediment at, bottom, at the bottom of the new one because you've tried to keep a little yeast. Um, now, you have a couple options. You can of course let it set and age and get better, which mead with age tastes better, just kind of a point and it's important to know. Um, but you can also just go ahead and bottle it then if you want to. The carbonation process of bottle carbing something requires you to add honey or a sugar to a fermentation after the, like before you bottle basically. So you're gonna take and add your honey or your regular sugar in just before you bottle. What's really important to do and to know is that you have to understand how much sugar you need to put in to be able to carbonate. There's such thing in this brewing world as uh, bottle bombs. Bottle bombs are where you put too much honey, too much sugar into your bottle or into your mead before you bottle. The yeast wake up 
and because they're real active and they're going crazy, um, they're creating a ton of carbonation. And that car carbonation eventually can cause a bottle to explode if it gets too pressurized. So you have to know exactly how much honey or uh, sugar to put in. My reference that I use for carbonating is actually based off of priming sugar that you get with like beer making. So in about every single beer kit you could have ever buy, you uh, get these little 100 grams of priming sugar, like sugars basically. And um, what I have tried to figure out and equate over time is like, okay, well uh, 100 grams of priming sugar for five gallons, which is a general beer like measurement. So that's about 20 grams per gallon. And that's to carbonate for light carbonation. Generally, you're not getting a super, super heavy carbonation in that way. Um, equating that to honey, you have to figure out how much sugar content is in like that priming sugar. And then you also kind of have to figure out how much honey is in there. And this is where life gets real tricky because honey is definitely more sugary than priming sugar. It is straight sugar. That's all it is. And it's actually got nutrients in it. So the yeast often will um, more effectively <laughs> ferment on it because... They can, I guess. Mm. So I, uh, I try to equate those two together. The big thing is you can best car bottle carbonate by um, actually separating out a little bit. Like let's say you add, okay, you get a beer bottle's worth of your mead ready to bottle. Okay, you can go ahead and add, let's say a teaspoon of honey into that uh, bottle and then you know stir it up lightly so it doesn't aerate and then you go ahead and bottle that and let that sit for about two weeks to test and see if that's too much sugar or not enough sugar but the worst thing you can possibly do is just guesstimate and go okay well you know what I bet that um, a pound of honey is what I need or two pounds of honey will be great to for this five gallon bucket of mead um, to carbonate it well, I'll go and spoil it for you. That's probably a lot of honey, and that all that honey is probably going to cause a bottle bomb. So take a smaller batch of it, add a small amount of honey, write down how much honey you've added, and you can do a, a couple tests of this to see if that's enough honey to carbonate it or if it's too much to carbonate it. But uh, you're going to end up... I just don't want you to end up with a bottle bomb. It's just not fun. Exploding bottles, is, it's just not fun to deal with that kind of stuff. So... Just don't deal with it. Don't do it. Um, you have to know your numbers. You have to understand how much sugar to add, where your yeast are at. Let's say, for example, you have made a mead, and uh, different than our, our first example, you made a traditional mead with that D47 yeast, again, a 14% cap, and I get my, um, my gravity up to one point, let's say one... Sorry, one point, yeah, one zero zero. That's or let's go even further than that. One point one zero five. I think that sets me at about thirteen point five percent ABV. So, when I put my sugar in, if I put enough uh, gravity, point, you know, let's say point zero five, right? Is that what I want? Point zero zero five of like honey into the whole bulk of it. Um, the yeast are going to hit their cap and stop carbonating in the bottle which is helpful you could even go further than that it just depends on your numbers uh, it is a game of science and so i just want to forewarn you that you have to do some experimenting with this carbonating in a bottle is hard because you have to know a lot more than just the alternative of um, doing it in a keg now the only reason i'm being really cautious about this is because it actually is a safety hazard if you don't understand this concept and you try to bottle carbonate without with very little knowledge, you could end up with a bottle that explodes. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Um, start with basic ingredients. Do, make your mead. Take a small portion of your mead that you want to carbonate um, and test it in some container in a beer bottle. Then you can get some sciencey things. And eventually you'll figure out how much, like a teaspoon of honey, how much can that actually carbonate most of the time. And uh, after you get that science down, it kind of helps a little bit. So bottle carbonation is really carbonation is really nice. I do it for beers all the time. It's actually very controlled for beers if you're using just the priming sugar. Anytime you're not using just the given priming sugar or given 
you know, sugar in a specific kit or whatever, uh, you were kind of playing with a little bit of fire. For example, I've made um, a couple beers before that I made one recently, I think about a month ago, month, maybe half a month ago. I don't know, a couple weeks ago. And uh, I had used a different kind of sugar to carbonate. I had used an Amoretti like artisan flavoring and then I bottled it. Well, when I did that, I wanted the flavor of that Amoretti flavoring in the beer, but I did not um, completely, I, I put more sugar in it than I needed to. So what happened was I, it was a small beer. It wasn't, a, I just did a little sample uh, tape batch of it basically, but I had these 12 bottles of beer that were getting to be very carbonated very quickly because it had too much sugar content. So what I had to do to fix my problem, which this is your fix for it if you run into the issue, take them and put them into the fridge. That will cause the yeast to um, cool down and they won't be able to be active because they'll be kind of hibernating again. But if you do make a bottle bomb like that, that's an easy way to fix it. And then you can go ahead if you catch it in time. If, um, if you don't catch it in time, if you open up a bottle and it's super carbonated and it's exploding, um, it's too late to put it in the fridge. Uh, honestly, you're just going to have a really carbonated mead and it might be game over for that. But if you're checking your mead, if you're like opening a bottle, maybe a couple days after you first bottle carb um, and seeing if it's very carbonated, then you can catch this early on. So bottle carbonation is a topic that a lot of people, a lot of people go through and we do this because we want carbonated meads. We want ciders and things like that that are carbonated and it just adds some extra dimension to your mead making. I, uh, I really enjoy making carbonated meads and, um, I think that you, you have to just know how to, how to do it well. Otherwise you run into issues. Here's a couple tips on carbonating meads. If you are making, well, first of all, if you're making a mead with like a juice or any sort of uh, ingredient that has met, uh, potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite already in it, um, that primary fermentation is probably not going to occur very well. So you're probably going to end up with something that does not taste very good. Make sure you're not putting anything into your mead making that has potassium sorbate or potassium metabisulfite when you're trying to ferment. If you are simply just trying to make are trying to add uh, more sugar content to your mead uh, after fermentation has occurred, that's okay. Let's say you've made a sizer, which is a apple-based mead, and you want to add more apple flavor, you want to add more sugar content from the apples, uh, you can go ahead and add apple juice after it has finished fermenting. Therefore, you know, you're getting more apple flavor, you're getting the sugars from that. Now, you might run into some issues with fermentation again if you're carbonating that way because yeast don't really do well with potassium sorbate metabisulfite they see it as a stabilizer so when they stabilize they stop fermenting and um, obviously if they stop fermenting they're not carbonating and that's uh, just kind of interesting but one little fun fact is I recently made a mixed berry mead and uh, I did not stabilize it and I had never done this before but I wanted to add maple syrup to this mead to give it a different kind of flavor profile. It was mixed berry, and I was like, this kind of you know, maple syrup taste will pair really well with it. So I, in my three gallon batch, I put enough to back sweeten my mead. And um, I haven't talked about back sweetening yet. I'm gonna do that in a different episode of this podcast because that's a whole nother game. But I just did it, I put enough maple syrup in there to back sweeten to a comfortable level for me for me. And, uh, what happened was there, I got some carbonation, even though the maple syrup I used was a cheaper brand of maple syrup and it had, uh, potassium sorbate, sorbate and metabisulfite already mixed into it. The, the yeast were able to chew on some of the soluble sugars, uh, in that, um, maple syrup and so because I had not hit their cap on the yeast, they actually picked up and did a little bit of fermenting, which caused a little bit of carbonation. It wasn't super carbonated. It was just lightly petulant. Um, but I was not anticipating that. In my brain, I was like, okay, well, I have a back sweetening method that has potassium sorbate. There's no way the yeast are going to actually pick up and ferment. I was wrong. And um, that's just a lesson to you. You can still have a little fermentation. They just don't do as well with that fermentation. 
So I do not want to dissuade you from bottle carving at all. I just want to make sure that you are careful with it and that you know how it works. Um, some people are completely against bottle carbonation and carbonating meads. And I think what I've noticed in a lot of commercial meads recently, about 50% of them are carbonated. And that's just because it reaches this different avenue of alcohol drinkers being that it's a mix of mead and cider, or sorry, wine and cider. You kind of have this mix and you can kind of get people to try meads if they taste more like one or the other. So when you go down the middle of it and you have a carbonated honey beverage, most people are pretty content with that. So I've noticed that at least. Um, there's a good portion of meads that are not carbonated though. You can get all the way through your mead making career by never carbonating and that's fine. In fact, I've only probably of the 70, I think four recipes I've made now. Um, well, let's say I've, I think I've made like 67 meads at this point. Um, I've probably only carbonated four, five of them at this point. And um, I just haven't done a lot with it. And I, I've done enough to have experience with it, but I'm just not a big carbonated person. There are certain ones that taste better carbonated. Like I have found that a light carbonation on like an apple sizer tastes really good because then it kind of tastes like a um, like a cider. And people really like ciders, especially apple ciders or whatever cider you can think of. So uh, I've found that that works. Other things have not worked as well, and that's okay. So that light carbonation on my... Um, on my mixed berry mead kind of worked. It wasn't fantastic though. So that's kind of where I landed on with that. Let's talk about the easier route of carbonation. Um, if you have the capability and you have the, the uh, equipment to be able to uh, force carbonate or keg carbonate your meads, then go for it. That's the best way to do this because you are not having to deal with any sort of re-fermentation, which is where the big sciencey question comes in, like how much do I put my stuff in? all that stuff. If you can just simply, um, if you can simply make, you know, put your meat into a, a keg and then just carbonate it that way, you're probably going to end up with something that's more controlled and uh, tastes better. In that case, you can also, I don't know. I just, I haven't bought the system yet. Frankly, I don't have a lot of room in here. I'm in my mead room currently, and I just don't have a lot of room to be able to do that, to store it even. So eventually I'll get there. I just might need to get some more space. I've got a ton of stuff happening in here. Uh, that does take quite a few pieces of equipment and uh, that's kind of a pain in my opinion. So carbonating is great. I've enjoyed a lot of carbonated meads. Um, it is it is something you just have to learn how to do and it takes some trial and error. Is there a chance you might end up making a mead that gets too um, carbonated? Yeah, absolutely. Will you learn from that? Hopefully. Um, I definitely have learned from you know, my experiences with this so far. So I enjoy carbonated meads and I'm going to continue to enjoy them. I have one sitting in my cupboard from a commercial meadery. Um, Redstone Meadery, if you're curious, makes a lot of really good carbonated meads. So go check them out. They do a lot of great stuff and um, I'm pretty sure they force carbonate. They must force carbonate because they're a big meadery. So yeah, that's the topic of, um, of carbonating and uh, I, I will talk about back sweetening in a different week with this. Um, I just don't want to get, that's a really in depth topic. And so, uh, I don't want this to be the longest episode in the world. So let's get to my last part of this. What's new with mead podcast. We are going to talk about some mead mistakes and I am currently setting in a mean mistake right now. What I mean by that is I last night, uh, whenever I was, I've, I've been making some traditional meads off camera to use for various other things. And because I've made, I think a couple different mead traditional videos at this point, I didn't feel like it was necessary for me to record another one because you guys have seen those things. And if you're curious, I've never seen a traditional mead made. I have videos on the channel, but, uh, the, I was, I had this traditional mead that's here behind me and, um, I started it two days ago. I started it with like a Lalvin EC1118 packet, you know, a high, high uh, gravity mead, did all this stuff. Anyways, I was like, there's no way, it's only been like 24 hours. There's no way this thing has kicked off a lot. Um, I just need to stir it a little bit. I was like, it's no way, there, there's just, I cannot see how this could possibly uh, degas like crazy. It's only been 24 hours. Well, 
I learned um, that in 24 hours, that mead really picked up and started going because I opened it up and I opened up my big cupboard here um, and I had, you can kind of see if you're watching, I opened this thing up behind me and ended up uh, stirring it up some and I found that it was very, it had been going in the, the, uh, <laughs> the yeast were very excited to have more oxygen because that thing foamed up and it was, bear in mind, it was in this big old white cabinet. It foamed up like crazy and spilled over the sides. And I felt like such an idiot because I was like, man, I should have known that would happen. I should have pulled it out and done some precautionary things, but I didn't. So I ended up cleaning, um, obviously not very well because my feet are still sticky, but I sat and cleaned this floor and this whole cabinet for like a good 15, 20 minutes and just cleaned up a giant mess because I, I didn't take the precautionary uh, things in order to keep from, well, to not make a mess essentially. So that was my most recent mead mistake. And in fact, after this video, I'm probably going to have to get a mop and mop up this floor because my feet are still very sticky, um, walking around here. So be very careful when you're making a mead. Um, some meads do pick up very quickly. Some of them will, uh, take off and you'd be surprised how much, um, how excited they get when new oxygen is introduced. This is not to say do not stir your meads in the primary fermentation or add oxygen. I think you should do that. I think I just, uh, I stuck my, my stirring wand in and stirred around a bunch a little too quickly. And that caused the yeast to just freak out. So be careful with that. But that's another mead mistake. I make them all the time. Hopefully I'm encouraging you, entertaining you, and uh, helping you not make the same mistakes. Who knows at this point. So thank you guys so much for watching. I've enjoyed getting to do this. We're six episodes in. This uh, Another episode of this will be out in two weeks, so be on the lookout for that. Feel free to share this with your friends. If you want to rate on uh, Apple Podcasts or even Spotify, stuff like that, that helps the podcast grow. Um, I would just would love to share this stuff with you guys because this is, this is fun, and I've uh, enjoyed getting to do it, and hopefully you get to enjoy and be entertained by me. But I've got a ton of links down below in both sections. So if you want to support the channel with a Patreon or if you have Facebook, we have a Facebook group that's growing. We got like 600 members on the Man Made Mead Makers page. So there's people talking left and right about mead making. It's really fun. Um, there's just also a billion links down there to support the channel. Everything you do supports the channel. And I want to emphasize that even just liking and subscribing helps me know um, that you support the channel. So we're almost close to 10K subscribers, which is pretty crazy. I'm excited to get there, and I hope you are too. So uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. I will see you guys in episode seven in two weeks. So cheers. Cheers.